Hi everybody, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a librarian here at the LSC Tomball Community Library. Welcome back to Screenshots, which is the series where I recommend to you great movies that you can watch for free through the Harris County Public Library. Now, films are a product of culture, and because of that, every culture's film output is going to be different. This is true even if two countries speak the same language. So American films are going to be very different from Canadian films, and films from New Zealand are going to be very different than films from Australia. And so even though we more or less speak the same language as the people in the United Kingdom, British films and American films look, feel, and watch very, very different. Some notable differences are the fact that British films typically have a sense of restraint that is not hugely common in American films. This is particularly true with British comedy, which tends to be more focused on wordplay and less focused on physical gags than American comedy, with some notable exceptions. They're also known for having a strong sense of history, probably because their history tends to be much longer than American history, more or less. So because of that, I thought it would be interesting to recommend to you some great British films so that you can see some of the ways in which British movies are different from American movies and why both are really exciting. Also, I would like to say this list was inspired by Becky, our YA librarian and a native of Manchester in the north of England. So many thanks to Becky for inspiring this list and also for adding some of the recommendations on here. So with that in mind, here are four great British movies that you can watch for free through the Harris County Public Library. Let's get started. When many Americans think of British movies, the first thing we tend to think of is period dramas. And if you're somewhat familiar with British period dramas, then you've likely encountered at least one movie made by the Merchant Ivory Production Company. Technically speaking, Merchant Ivory is not British, at least not exclusively. It features members from the US, the UK, and India, but they do have a definite fascination with Britain that permeates all of their films, whether they're set in the UK or not. They're probably best known for their adaptations of E.M. Forster novels, namely A Room with a View and Maurice, but I would particularly like to recommend their 1965 film Shakespeare Walla. Shakespeare Walla is set in newly post-colonial India and follows the waning influence of the British Empire over that part of the world, as well as the rising influence of the Bollywood film industry. It does this by following a roving troupe of English Shakespearean actors as they perform Shakespeare plays across the Indian countryside. The teenage daughter of these actors falls in love with a local who is himself in love with a Bollywood actress. The plot itself is a fairly standard love triangle, but cultural tensions simmer underneath the interactions of these characters that make it more complex. Although the film was made in 1965, which was well past when color was the norm, budget constraints forced the film to be shot in black and white, which gives it a wistful, elegiac quality that actually suits it perfectly. Although Shakespeare Walla is not set in Britain, and many of its characters are not British, it is an undeniably British film, and one of many that forces the UK to reckon with its imperial past, and the ways that that past impacts the personal present of millions of people. You can watch Shakespeare Walla on Canopy. Aside from period dramas, one of the greatest cultural exports that Britain has given us is comedy. British comedy is noticeably different from American comedy and is usually known for being dry and witty, whereas American comedy is known for being more loud and confrontational. Additionally, British comedy stands out by being more willing to confront subject matter that American comedians might consider to be too taboo to make jokes about, which is how we get our next movie, 2010's Four Lions, directed by Chris Morris. There are a lot of American movies about terrorism, but almost none of them are from the perspective of those terrorists or are comedies, which makes Four Lions an incredibly unique film. Four Lions follows a group of aspirational jihadists as they attempt to wage holy war on Britain, but they just can't quite seem to get a handle on it. 
Although the subject matter of this movie is certainly pretty grim, reviewers at the time of its release actually compared it to a classic Three Stooges movie, and the comparison definitely has some weight to it. Like a Three Stooges movie, the comedy of Four Lions comes from the inherent stupidity of the characters, but there's an additional layer of comedy by showing us the absurdity of terrorism as a pursuit. Czech diplomat and activist Michael Zontowski said that the sound of democracy is laughter, and so by giving us the freedom to laugh at terrorism, Four Lions actually manages to defang it somewhat. The global war on terror is infinitely complex, and every movie that's been made about it has been an attempt to make sense of it in some way or another, but Four Lions stands out from the pack by showing us the ridiculousness of this whole situation and giving us the freedom to laugh at it. You can watch Four Lions on Canopy. Like other examples of excellent global cinema, many of the great British films are rooted in a strong sense of place. And this is also true for speculative films, like our next recommendation, Alfonso Cuarón's Children of Men, released in 2006. Children of Men preceded the big boom in dystopian media that would take place in the early 2010s, and its dystopia is both much simpler and much bleaker than its competitors. Taking place in Britain in 2027, Children of Men is set in a world following two consecutive generations of human fertility. This has plunged the world into both an economic tailspin, because there are no new workers being born into the economy, as well as an existential one. If humanity is going to die out in a few years, what is the point of doing anything, let alone anything that would benefit the future? This fear has plunged Britain into fascism as it walls itself up against the rapidly crumbling rest of the world. But one of the refugees trying to escape into Britain, a young woman named Key, might actually hold the secret to humanity's survival as she is miraculously pregnant. This film is a real nail-biter, as it follows our main character Theo as he tries to smuggle Key into the hands of the Human Project, a group dedicated to trying to cure humanity's infertility. But Key's status as the last fertile woman in the world makes her a hot commodity for other groups who are trying to get a hold of her to further their own agenda. Children of Men is a prescient and deeply unsettling film, and as one Letterboxd reviewer described it, it is really the feel-bad movie of the year. But there's no denying that it is both thought-provoking and incredibly impressive to watch. You can check out Children of Men on Blu-ray from the Harris County Public Library. The last three films we've talked about have all been very English. But the United Kingdom actually comprises four distinct countries. England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And for our last film for today, we are going to take a trip out of jolly old England and up north into Scotland. 2013's Under the Skin, directed by Jonathan Glazer, is set in Glasgow, Scotland's largest city, and also includes jaunts up to the highlands, to the coast, and even to a castle. But while this might sound like a pleasure trip around Scotland's highlights, Scotland is filmed like an alien planet in this movie, and that isn't an accident. Because we're not viewing it from the eyes of a local or even from a tourist, but from the eyes of a strange alien being portrayed by Scarlett Johansson. She is on the hunt for something, and that hunt involves her luring and capturing human men. It isn't entirely clear what she needs them for, but it is abundantly clear that whatever it is, it isn't good. Plot is pretty thin on the ground in this one, but that plot has been replaced by atmosphere, which is thick and deeply unsettling. This is exacerbated by the fact that large portions of the film were shot with a hidden camera, as opposed to the large and incredibly obvious cameras that most other films are shot with. This gives the film kind of a voyeuristic feeling, which is further amplified by the fact that aside from Johansson, most of the cast were amateurs. 
This means that when you're watching it, you don't really see Scarlett Johansson talking to other actors as one character to another. It really feels like you're watching an alien being trying to seduce and capture human beings who don't really know what they're dealing with. By placing Johansson's character at the center of the film, as the viewer you really don't have much of a choice whether you want to empathize with her or not. And as she interacts with humans more and more, it becomes clear that she's starting to behave a little bit like them, and maybe even sympathize with them a little bit. This movie is technically classified as a horror movie, but as you watch it you begin to wonder exactly where the horror is coming from and who we are really supposed to see as horrific. You can watch Under the Skin on Canopy. Thank you for watching this episode of Screenshots. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter so that you never miss a future episode of Screenshots or any of our other great online programs. And be sure to let me know if I missed your favorite British movie. For such a tiny little country, Britain releases a ton of movies, so I almost certainly did. Thank you so much for watching, and another big thank you to Becky for recommending some of these movies and inspiring this video. I will see you next time. Bye!